Okay, hello everybody and greetings. Uh, today we're going to be messing with uh, some radios. I've had a lot of people contact me uh, who are getting these new Chinese import radios, specifically the Baofengs. Uh, they're the, pretty much the most affordable and easily to, easy ones to find uh, all over the place. You can pick up a Baofeng for about $30-$40, depending on which model you get. Some of them even go a little higher net. They've got some new models out. Uh, but they're a multi-band radio. Um, with pretty broad transmit receipt characteristics on them um, that are very very affordable for basic uh, FM 2A uh, walkie talkie sort of things uh, and also ham radio. Ham radio people have been buying them a lot and there's been a pretty good movement uh, of, to get these in the uh, sort of prepping survivalist uh, communities because they're they're so multifunctional uh, they can use them on standard GMRS, FRS uh, uh, frequencies, which are the walkie-talkies you're going to get out of, uh, say, your sporting goods or big box store. Uh, they'll also work on frequencies that they don't ha that are out there that don't make a lot of radios for, specifically like uh, MERS, uh, M-U-R-S, multi-user uh, multi radio service. Don't quote me on that. Uh, that's a VHF unlicensed uh, walkie-talkie frequency that very few people uh, make product for, but they, they're out there, it's unlicensed. Now, despite the fact that this radio can work on multiple frequencies, multiple licenses, multiple services um, within the VHF, UHF range, the legality of working it on such frequencies is another story. FCC gets a little kind of pissy if you use a radio that is not what they call type accepted, which means it's gone through their testing and approved to work on specific radio service housed within a set of frequencies. This radio crosses several services, uh, but is, I think, only type accepted for maybe one, if that. Uh, ham radio users can use them because in the ham radio service there is no need for type acceptance because um, people in the ham service are kind of nutty enough to try to build their own radios so they allow for that variance so we're gonna program these I've had a lot of people asking me about how to use these and we're gonna use a program I like here called chirp now one thing about the battle things the one critical thing I have to say about them is that um, their user interface sucks, quite frankly. Um, from a ham user's perspective, whenever I try to do uh, certain things in there, uh, I've not had luck um, doing it from the user interface. I understand there are ways to do it, but it requires a lot of repetition. There's some good flow charts out there on the internet as to how to do some uh, programming by hand. Um, but you have to basically go through, punch in your first set of, of variables for what you're going to save in a memory location, save it, go back and edit it again, punch in another portion, save it, go back in, punch in another portion, and then save it, uh, according to the flowcharts I've seen, which is ridiculous. You should be able to punch them in all at the same time. The, the variables are all there when you look at them, when you go in to, to, to modify a, a set of frequencies. But it just, some of them don't save first time around, some of them don't save second time around, some of them save third time around. So, you know, the, uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt compared to um, the ICOMs that I traditionally have, even the Yesus and Kenwoods that other people would use. Um, so, there, I've got a couple of bow things. They're not bad little um, handheld radios for short distance. They are what they are. You're not going to be talking around the world on them. You're not going to be talking even long distances on them. You may get a couple of miles if you're talking direct to somebody. Where they come in uh, handy is with ham radio operators who have repeaters. Maybe GMRS if you have a repeater system in GMRS. But hams have a lot of repeaters. And uh, if you have the license for ham radio service, technician is... Only a $15 test and 35 questions, and the questions are public, uh, pu part of public knowledge. They have a public question pool that's not that hard to pass a test. Uh, with a technician, you get access to all those, and so you can, the repeaters will pick your signal up and bounce them out even further. 
So what we're going to do is we are going to play with this radio. As I've been sitting here talking, you've been looking at a blank screen. Now this program we're about to use is called Chirp. I'm on uh, an Ultra book that I have uh, by Asus. I've loaded Fedora 20 on here. This is what you're seeing. You're seeing Chirp run under Fedora 20. Chirp is multi-platform. You can get it for Windows. Uh, I don't know if they have a Mac version running for it or not. You can go check their website. Uh, but I'm using Linux because pretty much everything I have is Linux. Um, so we have the Baofeng programming cable. It's a USB cable. And uh, from an electrical standpoint, it basically does a USB to serial conversion. And then it plugs in and talks across the headphone and microphone jacks in the radio. It's a pretty simple cable. And if one was so inclined, it would probably be pretty easy to go out there and find some cheap USB to serial converters and make your own. But the cables are readily available across eBay and Amazon for not that much. So, what the hey. I have a basically stock battle thing here that somebody sent me um, that they wanted me to program for them. I have my own. But we're going to start with a blank one here. I say blank. We're going to start with a factory default. It does have stuff programmed into it. So, we've got the USB play cable plugged into our computer. We don't have it plugged into the radio just yet. Just so that you can hear that. Frequency mode. I turn it on. We're going to plug the cable into the computer. And here from Chirp, it's blank. We're going to do radio. And we can say download from radio. Now, I've already done some testing, so it's already set up. But you're going to need to choose what your port is. In Linux, you're going to see this dev, TTY, uh, whatever. It's going to be a TTY USB uh, port. If you're a Linux person, you hopefully should know how to find out which one. In this case, I only have one plugged in. My main machine uh, in my uh, office would probably show a whole lot more of those because I have all sorts of th same things going on with it. TTY S0 through S3 are default ports that are reserved in case you have built-in serial ports on your computer. Uh, so in this case, we're just doing TTY USB 0. On Windows, it would be COM something. COM 1, COM 2, COM 3, COM 4. Generally, you're not going to see the USB ports come in uh, until somewhere around COM 4 after. That'll be probably be a USB port. You may have to uh, poke around a little bit and try and see which one is most responsive. I'm sitting here doing this. Uh, on my bed, so if you hear my, my bed creak, that's why. Uh, next thing up, you're going to choose your vendor. Now, Chirp is not specifically just for the Baofeng radios. It will handle multiple manufacturers. Linko, Icon, Kenwood, and Yesu are common um, name brand ham radio. Vertex Standard was uh, the commercial arm of Yesu, at least for some time. Uh, the Wusan, uh, the... Uh, Baofeng, TYT, etc. Those are um, the Chinese imports that we see so much of. So you can choose your model. And then there's a UV5R, UV3R that this program currently recognizes. Baofeng has got um, another model that's out called the GT something or another, I forget. Uh, probably very similar to these two. Internally, they're very much the same. They use the same chip in order to handle all their RF spectrum needs. They use this my, uh, basic Atmel microcontroller to control that chip. They have another chip to handle um, FM broadcast reception. Uh, they're pretty basic uh, across all the, all the the difference is is physically what kind of keys you're presented with, what size screen, and what firmware is loaded onto them internally from an RF spectrum. They're very similar. Uh, the UV3R is a lower power version. It's only 2 watts. UV5R is 5 watts. Um, the new GT, I think, is still a 5 watt radio. I don't know what difference it's going to offer. Uh, I haven't bothered to buy it. They want $80 for it. A 5R can still be had for 40 bucks. To me, there's no point. It's the same radio, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for my purposes. So anyways, we're going to choose this. We're going to hit OK. Is going to come up, says this is experimental, right? Let's move this into where I'm recording here so everybody can see this. It says it's experimental. In other words, this is an open source program and they've reverse engineered all this and this is not actually sanctioned by Baofeng to work. Uh, so, you know, 
use at your own will. Now, I've not ever had any problems with it. Uh, it's just their sort of uh, de facto liability warning. Uh, right now, we're reading, so there's minimal risk of um, data corruption in all likelihood. We're not writing anything in the memory. We're just reading, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, and I've, I've used this program several times. It'll, it's, it's fine. So we're going to say yes. <clears throat> it's going to sit here for a second and talk to the radio, and then we're going to pull it out and we're going to clone it. Ta-da! Now this is what we're looking at. The radio resets, uh, which you don't see on this screen, but the radio does reset and come back up. So let's go over what we see uh, in this radio. So we have the main frequency that your radio is going to listen to. Uh, this name right here uh, it simply says 001. You can, in the UV5R, you can do what's called alpha tagging. You can actually put a name into it. Um, right now it just has the numbers of the memory locations. They haven't put any names. Tone mode. Uh, for some radio systems, you can do what's called a tone. Um, there are different types of tones. What that is is that the, uh, anybody who's programmed to recognize that tone will only open their, their their radios will only receive your signal if they hear that tone. Now you hear this one says, says a tone squelch or DTCS. DTCS stands for digitally was digital tone coded squelch, I believe is what it stands for. It's actually a data burst that it hears. Um, <clears throat> the tone squelch is actually an audio signal that is overlaid on yours that you won't audibly hear yourself but the radio hears it. It's, it's a lower frequency that uh, is not passed as part of voice traffic. The radio itself hears it. When it hears the right frequency which would be this. Actually in the tone column this is what's transmitted in the tone squelch this is what it's expected to hear in order for it to open. And then you also have for digital tone coded squelch uh, the transmit and receive codes uh, for it to allow it to open. Now, let me be very clear about this. These technologies were developed to allow multiple people to share a common radio infrastructure. They were not engineered for privacy. When you look at an FRS or a GMRS radio, a lot of times they advertise that they have privacy codes. What they're talking about are these, they don't even do the digital tone uh, coded squelch over here. They do this privacy tone. Well, for anybody to listen to your conversation, all they had to do is tell their radio, don't expect a tone, and it just listens to everything on that frequency, including you. This is not an encoding. This is simply a matter of preventing interference with your conversation, unless somebody has the tone. But even then, nowadays, all of my higher-end radios, my ICOM radios, have a feature on them called Tone Scan. So if I don't know a tone and I hear somebody talking on the frequency, I can tell it to tone scan. It'll tell me what tone they're using, and I just program it in, and I can jump into the conversation. Uh, this is mainly used not so much person-to-person -person direct line of sight. Uh, this is used in repeater uh, infrastructure, uh, where people talk into a repeater that bounces their signal out at a to a greater distance. Um, this is to prevent interference with the repeater, since it's an autonomous system. If there's interference that keeps kicking the repeater over, you can put the tone uh, on the repeater you can you can tell it to only accept uh, transmissions with the right tone and it prevents the repeater from keying up all the time and getting hot and wasting electricity and, that's, and so on and so forth um, and of course you can use DTCS uh, kind of uh, really hasn't gained in a lot of popularity by the time they started putting digital stuff into the radios we started going full digital um, some systems will use it. I, in my area, none do that I know of. So don't get me to let's see. This is another feature, DTCS. I, I suppose it means polarity. I'm not entirely certain. Don't get me to lie. I don't use DTCS, as I just said. It's not in my area. Uh, so in some of this, we're not going to go completely over cross mode. I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, duplex. Um, duplex, when you're using a repeater... Trick is, is a repeater has to use a single antenna for both transmit and receive at the same time, and so uh, for what's called a, for a full duplex repeater that as it's listening it's also rebroadcasting. There are what they call simplex repeaters which will listen, record what you're saying, and then rebroadcast it right back out at the same frequency. 
that's not what this column is for. If you're talking into a duplex repeater that'll si that is simultaneously rebroadcasting what you're saying, you have to worry about a duplex. The duplex basically says whenever you key up your radio, I'm actually going to change the frequency by a set amount in order to and, and broadcast on that frequency. And as soon as you let off the key, I'm going to go back to your main one here to listen. And the repeater does the exact opposite. It listens on whatever the duplex uh, frequency is. And actually, this is specifying whether there is a duplex, whether it's positive or negative, how much of a duplex is right here. This is called the offset. How much you offset your frequency. And so, uh, in, in VHF world, uh, in ham radio in the 144, 148, uh, megahertz range in the ham world, uh, you'll see the 600 kilohertz offset is pretty standard. Uh, when you get up into UHF, you'll see 500 megahertz uh, is pretty standard. I'm, I'm sorry, I said that completely wrong. 5 megahertz is, is standard in UHF world. And then, of course, we have mode. FM is pretty much the most common one. Some of the commercial stuff has started going to FM narrow to conserve bandwidth, uh, but FM is what most systems are going to use uh, and those are the two modes that you're capable of with this system okay so let's go ahead and we're gonna save this as a backup uh, just so I can put it back where I need it to be and we're gonna say uh, and this is in our, our root folder so we're gonna say UV5, uh, UV5 or backup is all we're gonna call this um, <coughs> we're gonna say save and so I can open that back up and then just dump it right back onto this uh, radio and it'll go right back to stock the way I was wanting it to. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can go settings here and you can set your squelch and, and various other things, uh, various other settings. I'm not exactly sure what battery saver is. Some of these are features unique to the radio you have plugged in. Uh, pretty much all of these are actually unique. Um, <clears throat> the Baofeng 5Rs also have a dual display. Now they'll tell you it's a dual. Now they might somebody might sell it to you as a v, dual VFO, and that's a lie. It is not a dual VFO. Uh, you're not going to get that kind of money. Dual VFO means it has two receivers simultaneously. Uh, the Baofengs do not have simultaneous receivers. They have one receiver. And they display two frequencies at a time. There's a difference. Um, with a dual VFO, I can literally listen to two conversations at once if I have a radio that's dual VFO. On the Baofeng, it's going to choose one or the other based upon your settings, which one you've got selected, this sort of thing. You can be monitoring both, but not at the same time. It'll hop between the two in some fashion on radios like this. Um, I'm not going to get it. I don't know the specifics exactly how the Baofeng handles it. I haven't used it that much. I really don't have a need to listen to too many things at once. It gets a little confusing anyways. If I had a need to do it, I would go cough up the money and buy dual VFO radio. Uh, but you can change things. The squelch, um, normally on a radio, I'll just kind of show you with this one. Normally the radio is silent when there's no transmission, but in all actuality, what it's got is it's got a squelch, and this is, you're telling it how much of a background noise to expect uh, in your environment and that anything over that background noise it'll open up and receive. There should be a uh, monitor key on this one. Yeah, if you can hear it. When you go to monitor that opens the squelch all the way up so that you can hear everything as the radio is hearing it. It's not silencing anything for you and that's just static. So essentially you're setting the, the squelch level you're setting as to how high you think the, the and it's a relative, but you're setting it as to how high you think your background noise is going to be. Uh, battery saver, uh, I'm not totally familiar with that one. I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, backlight timeout, it, the, you have a backlight on LCD, how long it'll stay lit after you do something. Whether you want the beep enabled. Timeout timer, timeout timer means that um, how long it's going to let you hold down the key before it stops transmitting? And you said some. You know, when I first got into radio, I was like, well, I don't want a timeout timer. I don't want to tell me how long I can talk. Up until I lodged my uh, a mobile radio's mic between my door and something else, when I shut the door and it held down the it held down the key on the mic, 
for half an hour and chewed up somebody's repeater for half an hour and it really heated my radio up probably caused a failure I had in the future from that point um, that I had to have repaired because the thing got really really hot so timeout timers are not necessarily a bad thing uh, people get long winded on radio so 60 seconds is probably a little short you can obviously go quite a bit longer than that you know maybe if you go 180 or 300 seconds you know, if you spend more than three to five minutes at a time on the key, let off the key, you're probably uh, chewing up too much, uh, <laughs> too much battery. Um, display mode, you can choose whether or not you want to select frequency um, to be displayed, or name, or the channel number. Uh, and again, I said it, it shows two different displays, so you got to there are two different frequencies at once that you can select between which one you want to use, and that's what these two are, A and B. And then different colors, the backlight LED are going to show if you're doing standby, if you're doing receive, if you're doing transmit, whatever. You can also enable Roger Beep if you really want to. That's uh, fun with the uh, CB ears. In the name of God, do not enable Roger Beep when you're in the VHF, UHF range, and other services. It is really annoying. It's your radio intentionally sending some sort of a beep sound after you let off the key to let everybody know you've let off the key. I promise you, when I hear the squelch tail, I know you've quit transmitting. The squelch tail is that static sound at the end, and I know your radio has quit transmitting. I promise you, I don't need a Roger beat. It gets annoying. Um, go to Advanced Settings. We're not going to worry about DTMF side tone. You're probably not going to be messing with it unless you're in a hand setting and have some sort of need for DTMF, which is getting pretty rare nowadays. You can set up voice activation instead of doing a key. I would not normally suggest that. And you can set sensitivity there. Dual watch is what I was telling you about uh, where the two different frequencies it has, it can flip between one or the other. Uh, so you can enable that and it'll try to listen to both frequencies. It'll hop between them to some degree. But one's always going to have, one, it's always going to favor one or the other. And so that's what that priority is. It'll either listen to A more often or B more often if you want to. Um, alarm mode. This thing has an alarm on it and I dread it. You can use it as a personal alarm and uh, I just don't even mess with it because if, it, if you're transmitting an alarm you're tying up somebody's frequency. Yes everybody knows that somebody's in trouble but nobody can then use that frequency to try to coordinate to find you. <laughs> so it seems a little counterproductive to me. The voice when you hear it start up or when you hear it say something in the uh, in the menu, there's an English and Chinese voice. Um, some options for scan, which I haven't messed with scan really. I kind of sit on one frequency or the other. Um, you can enable whether it listens to um, FM radio. You can set whether or not it automatically locks the keys uh, to prevent people from using it. You, there's an unlock key on there that you have to press and hold down. It unlocks and then you can work on it. I don't know if that's time-based or if it just assumes whenever you start up to always be locked. Uh, busy channel lockout means that you can't transmit when it detects that somebody is talking on the channel. It keeps you from what everybody calls doubling, trying to talk at the same time. That causes a... Um, to anybody listening, when two people are trying to transmit at the same time, it causes what's called heterodyne. Um, and a couple of other things that I'm not going to mess with. You can set your power on messages, and you can set your limits. If you don't want to go full out uh, on the frequencies, you can set your limits. Um, so that you're only within certain ranges. If you're a ham radio operator, for instance, and you only want to use this to transmit legally on the ham frequencies, then you can limit yourself so that you're not out of frequency by accident. Um, and I think on some of these radios, you can actually widen them out to use frequencies that they didn't come advertised that they could use. So you can mess with that, do a little research. And then some other things. What's your primary frequency you're going to display? Are you in VFO, which stands for 
variable frequency oscillator. In other words, I'm going to dial in the frequency I want or memory recall, which means I'm just going to choose what my memories are. You can choose what your primary mode is when you turn it on, whether your keypad's going to be locked. Uh, when you go into memory recall mode, what channels on the A frequency and B frequency are showed, what your bands are for uh, if you're in VFO, which one you're going to choose, VHF or UHF band, what your power settings are going to be for each frequency set, your bandwidth. Now it says wide or narrow. You're pretty much, like I said, it's going to be FM wide. And it's a bit of a mis misnomer. Really, it's just considered FM. FM wide is what your broadcast stations use. Uh, that you receive on your car. They're very, very, very wide. Normal FM for normal two-way in most other circles, you just call it FM, but then they, they're calling it wide because they also do narrow, which is a little bit newer standard to help save. So bandwidth. Um, PTT IDs, which I've not messed with, we're not going to worry about. Tuning steps. When you're setting this up to be frequency agile, so that you can dial in which frequency you want. You can set how much it steps by whenever you turn the knob, how many kilohertz. Um, I would probably go smaller than that. In VHF, I would probably use around the 12 and a half because of the way some of the frequencies are, are set. Um, I'm sorry, in UHF, I would go around 12 and a half. Uh, in VHF, I'd probably go five or smaller. Uh, so you can set some of that. So let's go back to memories. So what we're going to do, let's say for instance, now you can select these, and then you can edit, you can delete, and leave it blank, or you can delete and shift up, which completely removes the row. For instance, if we were to go down, uh, let's do it to that one. We can say delete and shift up, and it clears it. And all of a sudden we went from 21 memories to 20 memories, and if you look at the names, what you remember all the names used to be the same as their actual locations, but now I've removed one of the locations. Uh, I wonder if I can undo that. Nope, can't. Oh well. So let's go down here. The other thing is, is that um, you can ask it. You can select that you only want to see certain memory ranges and whether or not you want to show the empty ones or not. And we're gonna, we are going to show the empty one. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down here to 21. We're going to show you how to do an import. This is the quickest way to get right, to get information in here. So import from... Uh, is it radio reference? Nope, not radio reference. Some of those uh, have passwords. Uh, you have to have an account. I think it's repeater book. Yep, repeater book, North American repeater directory. This is for amateur radio. So now you can go over here and you can select. Um, I'm in Texas. And you can choose a county. We're going to choose. Uh, we're not going to choose my county. But we're going to choose somebody's county. Let's just go with. Um, let's try Lubbock, Lubbock County, and then you can select which band. So it gives you bands here that you're really not going to use. 10 meter and 6 meter this radio will not do. This radio will do 2 meter and 70 centimeter in the ham world. That's what this is all about. This is ham. The repeater book is about that in, in the ham world, okay? And then uh, there's, you know, this uh, this is what they call 220 mag or one and a quarter meter, and this uh, 30 centimeters, 23 centimeters. This radio won't do those. It'll only do 2 meter or 70 centimeters. So let's put in 2 meters just for giggles. And we hit OK. And it shows all the different frequencies. Now this one's not selected for some reason. I don't know why. Let's just... Oh, okay. That is a... Uh, this is mode DV. That's digital voice. It's probably a D-star repeater. These will not do that. These are the old-fashioned FM. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, 
Um, they started going full digital in radios a number of years back. One of the big standards is D-Star, which uh, ICOM makes. It's based on a standard uh, that, that came out of in Japan. Uh, pretty interesting, also pretty pricey. Um, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to do these. And then um, I'm going to say OK. And that put it in at the top, actually, and overwrote the top settings. Uh, that's the one thing about Chirp, is that it's a little flaky. I selected down here. Um, let's say insert robo. No. So you think it should be there, but it's really picky about where you're going to where it puts things um, so you gotta kind of you gotta kind of mess with it I haven't really gotten it down but because I use Linux uh, the factory information doesn't work but you can go through and do all the I mean the factory uh, software doesn't work but you can go through here and and futz with it and I've used it and I've basically built my list one of the things I'll do a lot of times is I will go new and I will import it into just a basic uh, setting over here and then I'll just you know you can highlight multiple ones and then um, you can you know copy them and then paste them over and you know put them where you want them you can highlight in the list and let's do that just for giggles but let's not do this one let's let's say you want to uh, let's do an open stock config this is another interesting one you can mess with here uh, US calling frequencies these are calling frequencies uh, for what are called simplex for person to person direct they have what are called calling frequencies that people will listen to that are agreed upon calling frequencies when you're just looking for somebody for some purpose whether you're just wanting to chat or there's an actual emergency you need to call for um, so you can import those uh, one popular one I would expect now would 60 meter channels that's HF you're not gonna mess with it in this one um, maybe marine VHF you could mess around with some of those I think this radio might do them let's open them up and see marine VHF channels yeah these are 150s this rate 150s 160s so this radio would do marine VHF so there's another purpose for it uh, but MERS and uh, FRS GMRS are GMRS in and of itself is not unlicensed but FRS and MERS is unlicensed and so uh, this radio would probably uh, typically get used by somebody who's not a, like a licensed hand would probably get used on those frequencies quite a bit uh, in order to avoid somebody noticing them for you know violating type acceptancy um, which on an unlicensed band you know very few uh, FCC are going to care about. So let's open up, uh, say for instance, MERS. MERS is pretty short. It's five frequencies for MERS. It's right there. And they have MERS 1, MERS 2, MERS 3. And then the last two, blue dot and green dot, actually come over from a business band. They're grandfathered into it as part of this new MERS setup. They're kind of oddball. Um, you know, you have 151 uh, here, and you go 82, 88, 84. Well, that's, you know, 60 kilohertz spacing. That looks pretty normal, and you hit these last two, and they're kind of out there a little funky, but whatever. So let's say we want those, so we can take those, and we can select them. Now, what I'm doing is you select the first one. Let me get out of that. You select the first one. For those of you who don't know how to do multi-select, and if you want to do them singly, you can hold down Control and then click on them. Or you can go down to the last one in your list, hold down Shift. See, it already selected those others, so let's try that again. Select the first one, hold Shift, go down there, click on it, and it selects everything in between. That's first to last. Right click on it, copy, go over here. We're going to click here, and we're going to say Paste. And they pasted from where my cursor was, thankfully. So, if you're going to import, I, to me, the best way I found it to do it was to open up another uh, another uh, tab here. You know, you just do a new, and then you import whatever you want into that, uh, and then select it and copy it over into your working list, and it makes it pretty easy. 
Uh, no, I don't want to save those changes. And we're not going to mess with that one, so we're going to close that. So now we've got, we're not going to save this, but now we've got this just massive list of whatever that we're not going to have. Let's say we're going to do those two meters. Let's just, let's just kill what was there in the first place, shall we? Just select all those. And we're going to go delete and shift up. Okay, so now all we're left with are the two meter repeaters in Lubbock County, Texas, and the five MERS frequencies. It gives us 12 frequencies total. Um, oh, missed one. Let's delete that. 11 frequencies total. <laughs> and so you'll see over here, these have duplex, for the repeaters, they have duplex settings of the negative or positive uh, duplex, which means they're going to shift either plus or minus. Whatever this offset is, is 600 kilohertz, like I was telling you before for the repeaters. And um, since we imported them, uh, or we use built-in sources in the case of the MERS, they already have names on there. Now, if you create your own frequency uh, down here, you can add in your own name. But whenever you, for instance, go over here to these settings, if you don't, if you don't remember the frequencies, right, you can go, where is it? I think it's in basic settings. Yeah, to these display modes. And you can choose, oh, that's an alarm. You can choose, I want to see names, right? So let's do that just for giggles. I want to see the names of what I'm doing. So that way you don't have to worry about the numerical frequencies. What you're going to see in your display are these. Now, if your MERS or your GMRS or your FRS, that makes sense to you, or, you know, Marine VHF, what have you, uh, ham radio people will know these are the call signs of the people that are running the repeater, or what they call a trustee of a repeater. Um, it then makes it much sense to people who aren't hams, but the hams, they understand what that means. And if they're in that area, they will uh, entirely likely know, who, may know who that person is or may have met them. That, that's actually FCC issued call signs. And they'll be used to memorizing. Um, you know which repeater is which okay so enough yakking about it right so now we're gonna say upload to radio just for giggles right so we're doing a U TTY USB 0 again and it's our because we downloaded from a and this is one of the cool things about this because we downloaded from a Baofeng all of the settings everything is already set up to re-upload to a Baofeng it's defined within our backup here uh, or it's defined within our settings here that this is going to a Baofeng and all of those custom options are already there so you don't have to mess with anything so this is one of the reasons I say take a Baofeng, plug it in download from the radio and edit what's there because it just makes it much easier to, in fact I've never tried to upload when it wasn't set up that way I don't even know how much trouble that would be just download it, edit what's there, re-upload it back up make as many copies as you want so that you don't lose your place you don't maybe don't lose something you don't want to but we're just playing here, so we're going to upload it. And it says, hey, guess what? This is experimental, yada, yada, yada. I don't want you to tell me that anymore, so I'm going to click that. And I'm going to say proceed. And it's going to try its cloning process. Uh, hopefully it works. I have had these radios hiccup. Yeah, radio did not respond. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the radio off. We're going to unplug everything for a second. Plug it back in plug that back in power the radio back up you didn't hear it because I've got it plugged in upload the radio let's try it one more time TTY USB cloning yeah it's working there it goes so yeah there's a bug every once in a while but it's not too bad And voila, our radio is there. Um, let me check it. Just yep. When I go to the memory recall function, I now see those settings. So pretty easy. Now what we do is we go file, and we say open. And I'm going to open that backup file again, All right? And then. So it's right here. That's the original backup file. We're going to close this, and it's going to say, do you want to save changes? No, I don't want to save changes. So this is the original backup file, and guess what? 
Upload your radio. Okay. Cloning. Yep, there it goes. And radio resets, and everything's back to normal, just like it was before we started the whole project. So, hopefully, that lets you guys know how to, to, to do a few things. If you have any questions, please let me know. Meanwhile, I have to get dressed and go pick up my kids from school, and then go to my night shift later tonight. So, that's the end of this video. Again, my standard disclaimer, something I told you in this video was wrong. I don't know what it is, and neither do you, right? So, take it with a grain of salt. Go figure it out for yourself. Thanks for watching. Well, I gotta kill everything first. <laughs>